Okay, once again, today's webinar is Understanding and Improving Employee Turnover, sponsored by Trend Data. Uh, we have a uh, pretty, it looks like a lengthy agenda, but it's designed to take up uh, you know, not much more than a half an hour of time to review uh, the material that we have. Uh, we'll start off and give just a brief overview of the company, uh, myself, and uh, where we're located and what we do. Uh, then we're gonna talk about a little bit of industry data on turnover, both historically and uh, uh, within industries. And then we'll dive a little deeper and talk about um, uh, the turnover area itself, you know, what is actually considered good versus bad turnover. Uh, once we go through that, we'll discuss some effective retention strategies to keep your good employees. And then we'll finish up and talk about how technology can assist in uh, Rec uh, retaining your good employees and reducing that uh, turnover, which is detrimental to your company. Uh, then we'll give a brief demonstration of the Trend Data solution um, as representative of how technology can assist you. Uh, we have a section left open at the end of the demonstration for questions on either uh, the Trend Data offering or the um, uh, content of the um, webinar. And finally, we have a special offer for everybody who uh, attended today's webinar that we will talk about. So who is Trend Data? Uh, Trend Data is a cloud-based platform company um, that allows companies and organizations to generate advanced and predictive analytics by bringing together uh, uh, trended metrics from all of your various HR applications. Um, we know you have information in your HRIS system, talent system, payroll systems, I'm sure a number of others. Uh, we can aggregate all that information. What our solution does is aggregate all that information and put it into a platform where you can uh, report on it, uh, gain meaningful analytics and model and look at the future. Uh, Trend Data is headquartered in Plano, Texas. For some of you familiar with uh, this part of the country, Plano is a northern suburb of Dallas, um, uh, located just uh, to the north. Uh, other famous companies, JCPenney, uh, uh, EDS, now HP, are headquartered here. Um, the company was founded uh, by myself, giving the presentation today. I'm Tom McEwen. I'm the CEO of Trend Data, and my partner, uh, Mon Hamden, who is uh, heading up our board, and who was the founder of HR Smart and is very actively involved in uh, the running of uh, Trend Data. So let's dive into the content of the presentation today and start off on uh, using a, a definition of what exactly uh, uh, constitutes um, uh, employee turnover. Um, one definition coming from SHRM, that's the uh, Society for uh, uh, human resource management professionals, uh, calculates employee turnover at, by taking the number of separations or terminations at a company during a month and dividing that by the number of employees. It could be the number of employees uh, uh, employed at that time. Some companies take an average of the number of employees over a period of time. Uh, there's a number of maybe subtle uh, uh, differentiations on how certain companies actually calculate turnover, but they're all designed to get to the same um, the same uh, end. And it's not so much important as to, um, you know, which definition you use for turnover, but rather it's more important that you be consistent. You pick one um, and you use that as your, uh, your metric to track going forward so that you're pairing month to month uh, the same type of information. Little history on turnover just on the past decade in the uh, industry uh, shows uh, something as you consider the economy over the past decade, uh, isn't that surprising? Um, uh, turnover tends to be uh, uh, very high, um, particularly uh, voluntary turnover when the economy is good. So you can see back in 2008, uh, turnover, uh, total turnover was about 18%, but voluntary turnover uh, was about two thirds of that at about 12 and a half percent. You can see that ratio has tended to stay the same almost. So two thirds voluntary, one third uh, involuntary um, uh, turnover. And as you can see, um, uh, voluntary and involuntary turnover kind of ticked down during the Great Recession 
where there weren't as many jobs avail available and employees were tending more to stay put uh, rather than go checking out new opportunities, which may or may not have been available. But then as the economy started to improve again, um, towards the beginning of 2012 and going forward, as you can see, uh, turnover, particularly driven by voluntary turnover, uh, started to tick up to the levels it was back in 2008. So very, very much driven um, by the economy. Um, the data in this uh, particular study is provided by an organization known as called Compensation Force that not only tracks uh, um, turnover, but also what type of rewards and stuff are um, prevalent in keeping uh, employees on board. Another deeper drill down uh, from compensation force uh, shows by industry the various turnover rates. Um, as you can see, the voluntary to involuntary ratio stays relatively uh, consistent, but some industries show a lot more turnover uh, than others. And this is uh, 2016 data last year. Uh, hospitality, as you might guess, has a lot of uh, turnover because it tends to be very um, seasonal. And uh, some industries like uh, healthcare, which uh, are very um, hot right now, um, have a large amount of turnover, largely because there's a large amount of opportunity. Uh, it could be that there's a, you know, it's a very um, intense industry, uh, particularly working in hospitals and such, where there does tend to also be a lot of burnout. Um, but that's a, um, an area of some decent turnover. And then it kind of goes back and forth to some of these uh, other industries. But again, still that, uh, that um, ratio of voluntary to involuntary. Um, and it kind of leads into our next point of, you know, what do you consider um, bad or good turnover? So I think the easiest way to track this is to look at, uh, you know, two axes. Uh, one, uh, which would uh, identify, you know, the performance of your employees. And a second, uh, which would uh, look at them by tenure, how long they've been in place at uh, a particular company or organization. Now, logically, you would think that, um, you know, losing um, high performing employees is bad, uh, bad turnover and losing low performing employees generally is good turnover. That tends to be more of the uh, uh, involuntary turnover is uh, low performing employees that uh, tend to be pushed out of companies or let go. Um, but as you switch to looking at the tenure axis, you start to get a feeling of, uh, you know, how the difficulties in evolving talent. So in the first year of uh, anyone's employment at a company, it's uh, very difficult to evaluate what's bad versus good turnover because you have very little uh, performance data. Uh, most companies run their performance uh, evaluations on an annual basis, but that's a uh, uh, been changing and evolving of late, and companies are starting to do more um, uh, um, quarterly and uh, real-time feedback on performance. But still, there's not a lot that's available because your employees aren't really up and as productive in their jobs yet. Uh, still, first-year turnover tends to be the highest um, uh, amongst companies. Uh, just a flat-out figure is that 25% of new hires at our company are gone either by um, being let go or leaving the company within the first six months. So it's a very volatile and uh, erratic time for um, employees staying and going. Um, what kind of complicates that from a company or organization standpoint is most employees are not profitable uh, in their first year. So if you get to the point where you're evaluating someone and they're not uh, doing well and you're thinking of letting them go, um, you're already going to be writing off some kind of investment. Uh, so it's a question of, you know, how do you evaluate what is uh, um, uh, necessary to get um, uh, data as to, um, you know, what you want to do with those first year employees. So you need some type of early indications, early indicators uh, without having full productive performance data. So, you know, so how do you get that information? Um, well, one place which is uh, um, very useful to get early indicators is during the training and onboarding phase. Uh, some companies are very um, dedicated to giving uh, hardcore training and onboarding through that first time period, and some tend to be very perfunctory about it. Uh, I would emphasize trying to do a, as much training as you can at the beginning uh, when someone comes on board, and uh, it kind of serves two purposes. You know, one, you want to get people up to speed and, you know, as fast as you can on what's going on at the organization. But also in uh, classroom <clears throat> type environments, 
are a very good uh, opportunity to observe how well people are engaging and picking up information. Um, I would uh, encourage, you know, they don't have to be um, SAT type tests or stuff, but uh, you should, uh, in some respect, be quizzing and testing your employees as they're moving through the process, both through the formal training and what comes after. Uh, it does again, doesn't have to be, you know, ABC, whatever type grading, but something that can give you an indication of, uh, you know, how well people are picking up the material and how productive they can be. I highly encourage, uh, particularly in formal training settings, to um, assign group projects because uh, this gives you an idea of, uh, you know, people's ability to fit in in the culture and to work uh, with others in the organization. So you can see kind of a group dynamic and what type of not only productive employee someone's going to be, but how they're going to be as a kind of a member of your company or your community. And you shouldn't let training be just kind of one time drink from the hose, uh, the fire hose first week in an organization. Uh, you should have some type of formal training in the beginning with periodic refreshers, particularly throughout that first year. You know, they can be quarterly. They don't necessarily have to be at regular intervals. But I'd say through that first year, um, continue to do little tidbits of training and also uh, observation of your employees as you're doing that uh, training. It could be on the run training while people are doing their job, or it could be you know, one day here, uh, sessions online or whatever, but continue to, um, you know, train through the first year and, uh, again, get a, uh, indications of how your employees are doing. Um, another really good um, uh, method, and this one can be a, a little more costly, but when it's uh, used correctly, is a very good uh, method of getting early indicators of how um, early employees are doing. And that is to assign um, a mentor to someone uh, who's just coming on board. Uh, it has a multiple uh, amounts of benefits to the organization. Uh, one, uh, uh, individuals are able to learn very well uh, when they're assisting someone who's doing the job that they're moving into. Um, it's tough to uh, get up to speed maybe of every aspect of a job, but if they're working with a senior person or at least a more experienced person at the company doing that job, you know, they might be helping preparing presentations or writing sublines of code. Um, and in more of a, 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 an evolving uh, um, a process where gradually they're coming up to speed. Um, also by assigning a mentor who this person is helping out and is giving them some guidance, it gives you a second opinion on uh, you know, how well this person's doing. You can observe you know, as a manager or as a head of a department or HR, but giving someone that uh, um, concentrated a look at someone gives you a very good opinion on how they're doing. And it also has, um, as I said, uh, other uh, benefits is uh, it gives you an opportunity to take a high performer, uh, give them some more responsibility and an opportunity to start doing some management or career training. Usually you have high performers who are um, you know, very anxious to move up the corporate ladder and uh, uh, you, you need to kind of test them and give them some training. And the mentorship uh, aspect is a very good opportunity for that. And it gives you an idea of the, the mindset of the person. You know, someone is very willing to step up and be that mentor um, that shows, you know, good uh, attitude and ambition, uh, where someone says, no, I really don't have the time, is probably someone who's uh, maybe just going to continue to be a good performer, but not maybe, um, you know, a manager or a leader going down the line. So, um, oh, and I did want to say, so if anybody uh, uh, recognizes this movie that I used over here to the right uh, as an illustration of uh, um, uh, working together and learning, uh, we, uh, the first person who can chat in the uh, name of that movie will, in fact, get a $25 Starbucks gift card. So uh, uh, if you know the name of that movie where that scene's from, uh, go ahead and we will uh, set, follow up and send you a, a Starbucks gift card. Um, uh, back though to, um, you know, performance and tenure, um, as you look again, uh, moving beyond that first year, now you're into the second year of, um, um, employee tenure. Now the, um, individuals are starting to break down into, um, uh, performance bands. So you have your, you know, your high performers, your average performers, and then those who aren't uh, maybe not doing particularly well. And you start plotting your activities as to um, what you can do with these particular employees. Your high performers, um, you start looking at, um, 
you know, for maybe bigger roles within the company. Um, so you start talking little career pathing and coaching and mentoring to these employees because uh, they've obviously hit the ground fast and are doing very well. Um, the middle band, the average performers, um, you probably are looking at, okay, how can I motivate and push these employees so that they become, you know, high performers. And then the uh, low performers, you're at a point where, okay, now you got to make a decision. To, are these people worth, you know, can you putting work and effort into, or do you look at replacing them? So you know, a couple of uh, different, uh, um, you know, uh, paths looking depending on how people are starting to perform in their in their second year. And then as you evolve forward, uh, you should be weeding out the uh, uh, low performers to getting to a point where you know the majority of your company is above average and high performing individuals. And once you get to this point, um, you're looking at really. Uh, any loss or turnover of people in this, this level is, is going to be bad turnover. These are going to be people uh, that you don't want to lose from the organization. Uh, so um, your focus, hen, uh, particularly for this group, turns almost specifically to retention. How do you keep these particular employees on board and continue being productive and motivated and enthusiastic about the company and, what, and their job? Um, I do want to point out, though, that uh, not all um, turnover um, is necessarily performance related. You know, you could have a very high performing individual uh, who's just, um, you know, bad for the company. You know, you have that, uh, we've all worked with them, very toxic employees who, you know, might be a really good salesperson, might be a really good developer, but they so annoy everybody around them or they're constant complainers spreading a bad vibe or mojo that you, um, uh, just get to the point where, you know, their performance is less relevant to being able to, um, uh, you know, getting their job done. Uh, there are other areas where you might have, um, at least on paper, people getting uh, high performance marks that may not be high performers. Um, if you've been in management for a while, you know, occasionally you have a, a weak manager who might be a performance problem themselves, but gives all of their employees high marks just because they're afraid of any type of turnover or that they just uh, are very intimidated or whatever. So you know, that would be one problem anyway uh, that you would have to deal with that manager. But you got to find a way to weed out, um, you know, people giving artificially high employee grades. So you might have um, 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 individuals who, um, um, you know, are getting high performance grades, not doing them. So having the ability to find out, you know, if that's a, a management problem to deal with. And occasionally you have a, what I like to talk about are protected employees. Often I've had these come in when I've been at companies where we've had acquisitions or mergers where someone comes in and they get a lock-in period where they can't be let go from the company except for a, um, a large payout and uh, they tend to be, you know, kind of sloughing off or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, these are just some examples. So not, not all turnover is based on performance, but most of it is and, and should be. Uh, by the way, this is another uh, opportunity to uh, uh, win a gift card if anybody can identify this particular basketball player. Uh, we will um, also give a $25 Starbucks gift card to the first person who chats that one in. Um, so let's talk about retention a little bit and uh, what are some of the more effective ways to keep your um, key talent uh, in the organization and reduce um, bad turnover. Um, World at Work did a study not too long ago, um, and World at Work is a total rewards organization, mostly focusing on um, compensation type strategies, but they often uh, do surveys that talk about uh, what is the um, best way to keep your employees on board, what um, recruits uh, individuals to uh, various companies and various um, uh, retention strategies. So they did a, a survey last year and it talked about not only the main reasons why people leave companies, but what are the most effective ways to keep your key talent in place. And interesting, because it was a, um, uh, a study based by a rewards organization, the top one was actually sitting down and talking to your employees about uh, their career path and what kind of training can be offered to help someone become a um, manager or leader or grow within the organization on a career path was the most effective uh, method of retaining key talent. The second one, um, and I underline in red, is paying your key talent above the market rate. Uh, sometimes you think that uh, you have a key performer who is um, you know, making a certain amount of money. You think they might be un 
unhappy and you go and give them, you know, a 5% or a $5,000 raise or whatever it is, and they still go and leave. The emphasis is on uh, paying at or above market with uh, key talent. Uh, often uh, these people tend to be very, um, uh, tend to be very um, uh, aware people, your high talent. So they're probably out and there's a lot of public information available as to, um, you know, what the average pay is for various positions out in the market. So it's probably um, uh, worth noting that your, your high performers are, are getting called by headhunters or checking the internet and finding out, wow, this, uh, the average pay for this position is 10% more than I'm making. So it's uh, incumbent on companies to uh, and organizations to go out and seek out that information so that they're paying their people at the right rate. And then the third uh, most effective is key talent is uh, in instances being able to provide flexible hours and telecommuting. Now this is kind of a tricky one as well uh, because you may not have a, a company-wide telecommuting policy um, and it might be something uh, that uh, doesn't work for everybody. I often recommend, depending on what your company culture is, is making this kind of an earned perk. So if you have most of the people coming to the office, um, if someone distinguishes themselves and you know shows that they can work by themselves to you know provide uh, telecommuting and more flexible hours. Um, but uh, if you make it a company-wide policy, you open yourself up that one, if you ever want to take that back, or two, um, you know, when it's offered to some people instead of others. Um, and it's often good to try to find a way to make that a, a perk um, for, for performance. But you know, these are the three most effective ways, again, according to World at Work, as to uh, uh, keeping your key talent. Um, this is a Cornell study that was done a few years ago. What are the effects of uh, uh, employees leaving companies? Uh, you can tell this was done a few years ago. It's very primitive graphics. But you've got uh, performance of the individuals over here to the right and then to the left. And then you have kind of the plus and the negative of, you know, the plus being your high performers as to why they might leave a company and the negative uh, are your low performers. Uh, high performers, according to this study, and not inconsistent, what we talked about on the prior slide, is uh, they often leave either because of pay or lack of advancement opportunity. Those are the reasons they give on uh, out surveys when they leave the organization. Uh, low performing employees, when they leave, it's usually a complaint about their boss or the demands of the job or the absentee or you know personal time off policies or they've had a tough time understanding the job. Um, tend to be the common uh, high and low performers reasons for leaving. Um, but if you go lower on this graph and you see all these pluses, you can see that um, the outcome of losing these high performers can be very detrimental. They're almost automatically employed very quickly after they lose. They usually lose to go to another job. Uh, it's usually a better job, the one they wanted from your organization with the better pay and the advancement. And very often it's to a competitor of yours. So being able to identify key performers, not only the impact it has on your organization, um, but also um, you know, arming your competitors is, you know, is very key to make sure that you control that, that, uh, that turnover rate. Um, you know, just talking a little bit about the cost of losing high performers um, you know, is, is many fold. Uh, first of all, there's the replacement cost. If uh, someone leaves and there's nobody to take that job right away, all of the recruiting, training, um, searching, and everything you have to do to get a new employee in the door. There's also the productivity loss of while that job is vacant, um, what's not getting done and what's not going to the company bottom line. Uh, often uh, you know, very experienced and talented people when they leave an organization, they take a lot of intellectual capital with them. You know, you can write um, uh, non-competes and everything to keep people from you know, really taking things with them, but you really can't uh, um, prevent what walks out inside of someone's head, which they can apply to a new opportunity. Uh, so, you know, that's very costly. And then there's the uh, impact on morale and the culture of an organization, particularly when a high performer leaves. I guarantee you when, um, you know, somebody very productive in an organization leaves and people find out uh, where they went, uh, almost instantly everybody goes uh, to their website to check out the new company and uh, not surprisingly click over to the careers page to find out if that company's hiring. So a lot of uh, cost of losing high performers. Um, uh, some more information from SHRM, uh, they actually estimate that the 
cost of losing uh, any employee is about 90 to 200 percent of salary, uh, depending on their level of performance. And I've actually seen studies where it's a lot higher, uh, particularly when you get into the management and the executive ranks. So, um, you know, uh, make, making sure you hang on to your high performers is, uh, you know, very key, uh, both from uh, a morale and, uh, uh, of course, um, a financial standpoint. So finally, you know, how can technology help you in this um, retention and identification problem? Well, it's a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, it can help you visualize the problem. You know, there's the old saying, uh, you can't fix something if you don't know what's broken. Uh, so um, being to have a technology solution with very um, good visualizations will allow you to see um, you know, what's your turnover rate? What's it been the last couple of months? And, um, you know, first of all, identify if there's a problem. Uh, second, it can help you narrow down on the problem. So, you know, sticking on that, you know, the term of turnover, since that's what we're, we're discussing today, um, allows you to drill down on outliers. So you might have a turnover that's, you know, 15% for your organization, but it might be 10% everywhere except in uh, development where it might be 30% or Europe where it might be 30%. And you may not have to implement company-wide policies to reduce. You might have to just focus on that one area. Also giving the ability to kind of align uh, what's going on externally with these particular trends. So if you see that uh, uh, turnover has been going up the last couple of months and you can kind of align that and see, well, I put in a new general manager at that time period or I cut bonuses or put in a new benefit program, that might help you get to the source of why things are starting to go askew. And then finally, it uh, gives you the ability, um, not all solutions, but uh, give you the ability to model scenarios. What if I change this, uh, offer more money or training or um, allowing to remote, uh, work remotely? You know, How's that going to affect the trend and allow you to do out some modeling like that? So a lot of uh, good advantages uh, through technology um, that we're going to move on and demonstrate here um, now. Uh, we'll take a look at the trend data solution. So if I go over to um, uh, my screen here, what I bring here is the, um, uh, the trend data dashboard. You can see that you have um, a login screen that gives you a lot of key metrics on the heartbeat of your organization. Uh, so for example, um, you know, we've got one metric here entirely devoted to turnover, which we'll spend most of the time on. Uh, but you also have a little uh, uh, information on other ones that could be, uh, for example, might be um, responsible for turnover. As you can see right here, we have um, a look at, uh, we're paying a little bit below market in our uh, average salary uh, aggregated for the whole company. So that might be a reason turnover is where it is. We have, um, uh, performance scores, uh, everybody's three and above, which would tend we have uh, um, average and above employees, um, but we're only putting our very, very top people into professional development. Uh, so that could be telling us something. Now you'll see under each of these metrics, you have three buttons. You have one that allows you to drill down on that particular metric. Um, you have one that allows you to trend it to analytics and one that allows you to go to the predictive scenario. Before I go to turnover, I'll just look at this one example here um, uh, for the number of employees in the company. So right now this says I have 252 employees in the company. And if I drill down, it will give me a look and show me that uh, most of my employees are located in the US with uh, scattering through a few other geographies. Uh, you can also drill down and look at by department where are all your employees. Uh, you have uh, the majority of them are in development uh, second being uh, marketing and support. So it gives you a lot of different ways to look at uh, a, a particular metric. And you can also go into some advanced filters if you wanted to look at, you know, perhaps all your developers in US or in uh, India or something. Uh, you can do a combination of filters as well. Uh, so um, a lot of ways. And uh, what we're showing you, what I'm showing you right here is the out of the box version of the trend data solution. So these are the package metrics you would get if you just bought our um, um, out of the box solution, but we can create and uh, build any kind of metric that you would want as long as it's based on data that you have available. Now uh, let's move over to the, um, again, the focus of the webinar and look at turnover, for example. So this particular graph shows me that um, my current turnover for this month uh, is 7.7%. And I should remind that these are all metrics. And what metrics are is a snapshot in time. 
it tells you what it is for the current month or the current time period you're looking at. So it's showing for this past month, uh, I have a 7.7% turnover. Uh, so I can turn that metric into analytics by touching the second button. And what that will give me is uh, over the last year, how has my turnover been going? Um, so this current month, as I said, is 7.7%, uh, but what has it been for the last year? And again, we can configure any time frame you want and have multiple time frames, or if you want to look over the period of uh, turnover. Um, but as you can see in this particular pattern, you could see um, turnover was roughly the same as it is now a year ago. Uh, it started to slump down, but then started to move up and then really moved up here um, towards the beginning of the year. So I talked a little bit about aligning events with, uh, uh, with uh, trends. Uh, so if you push this events overlay button, it'll tell you in January, we started implementing a new uh, benefits policy. So as the trends started to go up here, uh, the company took a preventive action and maybe gave some more benefits to the employees. And it didn't have an immediate effect because maybe some people were already in the process of leaving. But it gradually it picked up and then it started to come down again. So it might give you an idea that this ability, this uh, benefits policy had some positive effect uh, at the company as it started to move turnover uh, down. Um, what um, you can then start to do is uh, things have started going down. You can move forward then into the predictive view. And the default view there is going to show you what turnover has been for the last six months, and then just kind of based on that progression, uh, where is it going uh, towards the future here? And as you can say, we have a good uh, look at turnover. It's uh, uh, heading down so that the benefits policy is working to a certain extent. Um, but how is it affecting overall, and can I do anything to make it possibly a little more um, effective? So what I have here is my summary view, and as you can see, it brings up all of the metrics in the system and uh, will give me the opportunity to maybe play with a few scenarios that might uh, even further help me reduce my turnover. So for example, if I go on to the modeling button, you'll see three of the fields uh, start lighting up so that I can actually change them. Uh, one is the average salary within the organization. Um, uh, so um, we talked about being a little underpaying as a, an aggregate in the company. So uh, what if I went off and gave a, uh, say a, a roughly average of a 3% raise uh, throughout the company. An expense, expensive proposition, um, but uh, how does that help me out? So if I go ahead and uh, change that to 83%, you can see it really didn't do a lot uh, to move the needle. So um, maybe I don't wanna go ahead and, and spend that money there. Um, uh, I have a fair amount of employees working from home right now, about a little over 20%. If I were to increase that trend and start letting more people work from home, uh, you can see that has a, a, a more defined uh, effect on the uh, trajectory of my turnover. Um, another area might be uh, uh, increasing the amount of uh, money I spend on professional development. As you can see, I've got uh, only really 5% of my high performers in professional development. Um, if I increase that, and again, that's going to cost money to do more training, but maybe that's a better use of, uh, of that money. If I increase that to, say, 15%, as you can see, that has a dramatic, more dramatic increase on the uh, uh, downward span of um, uh, uh, turnover. And also, as I talked about, I can drill down even at this point and look at how is that affecting my performance. Uh, once I click this button, I could see and it's particularly having a good effect on high performers because uh, that is the key area is what's going down um, in driving um, uh, turnover. So uh, I've done a good job using these scenarios and putting my money in the right place to be able to um, uh, reduce turnover. So we've been able to address those three areas that uh, were brought up in the survey, the uh, compensation, uh, uh, flexible remote hours, and the ability to talk career and um, training. So um, I'm going to go back to the dashboard here just for a second and point out a couple of other things. So uh, all of this information comes from your multiple data sources. Turnover is probably mostly driven by information you have in your HRIS system. Maybe some of this information, other information comes from your talent systems. And uh, information like uh, revenue for employee, you might have to pull from a financial system. Um, 
So we do have some uh, manual areas where you can enter, particularly financial inputs that may not be in your HRIS system, such things as uh, revenue and total hiring costs to help calculate those particular metrics. Others are driven by your various data sources. So I'm going to show you just how quick and easy it is to bring information into the trend data system. So for example, uh, we can have uh, uh, integrations written to all of the major systems out there. Our system, our, um, uh, system is built on an open platform with an open API, so we can build integrations with uh, wherever you might house your data, and we can have multiple integrations. But kind of one of the key things is uh, the ability to let you get up and go quickly with our solution. Um, really, the two main ways of bringing data into your system is an integration from another system or being able to do a, a file upload. Often companies start with the file upload because it's a very good way of uh, cleaning the data within your system. So we've designed what we call our TUF, the Trend Data Universal File Format, which is nothing more than a, a 50 column CSV file that you can output from any system um, and even combine from multiple systems. And the ability to just quickly be able to out that from any report writer um, in uh, whatever system you use um, and upload into our system dramatically decreases the amount of time it takes to get up and going. So if I just click on this tough, it gives me a listing of all the fields that are in the tough file I'm ever bringing in. And then I need just go to this uh, upload uh, icon and go out and find uh, the particular file that I'm looking for. And uh, then once it's identified, I just uh, quickly save it to the system. And, you know, in a matter of seconds, I've uploaded uh, the latest batch of data into my system, and it will have uploaded all of the information on the dashboard. So quick overview of the Trend Data solution. Uh, I'm going to go back to the um, uh, presentation and finish up with just a few more uh, pieces of information. Uh, first of all, I did want to um, open it up for any questions. If you want to submit by the chat capability, uh, I do have a few that have come in during the course of the presentation, but if you want to uh, chat in any additional questions, I can uh, answer them. Um, one of the questions I got was, uh, uh, can your system uh, do very custom metrics by industry? Um, yes, it's very easy to um, configure uh, different metrics. Um, you know, if you have something that's very specific to the healthcare or the finance industries, as long as you have that data in your system, uh, it's very uh, um, easy for us to then construct the formula that calculates the metric. So that's not very difficult at all, yes. And uh, what I was showing you is the out of the box version of the solution. So if you can order right now, you can get those 15 metrics already calculated and there's no implementation at all. If you want, uh, you know, additional metrics, we can build them for you based on your um, your own formulas and data. Um, second question I have here is, uh, do we offer any kind of consulting on best practices for establishing um, not only metrics, but collecting metrics and uh, developing analytics? Absolutely. Uh, you know, our implementation is not just about setting up our system. Uh, we want to make sure that you're going about things the right way and creating the right processes. Um, to building a system. So yes, we do We do have that particular service available. And uh, it's this third one is actually a lead in <laughs> to my next slide is can, can we trial trend data with our own data in it? Uh, okay, well then uh, if I don't have another question, I'll just move to my next slide. Um, that is the offer that we're giving to anybody um, on the webinar today. So uh, we will allow you to um, trial the trend uh, data solution with the, uh, um, uh, metrics that you saw in the demonstration at, at no charge for 90 days. Uh, we wouldn't build any integrations. We would have you use the uh, tough file upload methodology. Um, we won't be built. We wouldn't be using the predictive methodology just yet because that is something we would have to come in with our data science uh, just to construct. But you'd have everything from the metrics to the analytics, the events uh, overlay, um, and the easy tough file upload methodology. We don't require you to sign a contract. We probably sign an NDA just to protect, uh, you know, you'd probably want that just to protect your data, and we'll provide free support during the entire trial. So if you're interested in that offer, uh, just go ahead and email us at uh, marketing at trenddata.com and just uh, include this pro promotional code from today's webinar, uh, which would allow you to then um, you just identify that you're on and let us track where um, you found out about the, the offer. So. 
Uh, that being the case, uh, the last person I have is, uh, uh, do, I'm trying to find out if anybody, uh, I think um, nobody answered the first one, uh, Tin Man. Uh, let me just check the chat because I thought I saw, um, nobody got the first one. It was, uh, Den, um, Tin Man was the name of the movie. Um, uh, it was a, it is it's from 1987 about aluminum side siding salesmen who tend to work in pairs when they go out uh, selling. Um, but we did have a winner of the second one uh, who um, guessed that this uh, uh, player here was Dennis Rodman, and that was Vanessa Parton. So yes, you were correct, Dennis Parton, De uh, Vanessa Parton. So we will reach out to you and uh, give you your um, uh, Starbucks gift card. Uh, for guessing that correctly. Um, yes, Dennis Rodman, a controversial individual, but was a part of five championship teams. So, you know, whether you got rid of him for performance or not um, uh, was the discretion of the various teams. So uh, that's it. If there's no more questions or uh, interaction, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us uh, at marketing at trendata.com and we'll be happy to follow up with you on any questions. Um, and uh, thank you for your time, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again.